Chris Nash's 2024 hit In a Violent Nature is an ode to the slasher film while also deconstructing the genre it revels in. Now I thought the territory of slasher deconstruction was well worn before. Hell, we were getting parodies of slasher movie tropes in 1981. What makes your voice sound so funny? I'm disguising it, Smog. How? By talking through a rubber chicken. I thought it sounded like you were speaking through a rubber chicken. And everything since Scream has either had to wallow in its own excessive navel-gazing, or market itself as a return to the classic formula. In most cases, both of those options felt tired and cliched by the mid-2000s, which is why the genre fell off and was replaced by torture porn, paranormal jump scare fodder, and trauma-inspired elevated horror. You know, it's like scary, but with complex emotional and thematic underpinnings. In short, it seemed like the genre was hollowed out and desiccated like a carcass sucked of its nutrients by opportunistic critics, fans, scholars, and filmmakers. Your mileage may vary on how much juice you think the genre has left, but for now we have Nash's contemplative, almost hypnotic take on the genre. This is by far Nash's most ambitious project. His previous work includes special effects work on the beloved Psycho Goreman, and a contribution to the anthology The ABCs of Death. This video deconstructs some spoilers, so go see the movie first if you're interested. And chime in on whether you'd like to see filmmakers go back to more straight storytelling or continue playing with genre conventions. Let me know in the comments. If I were to sum up In a Violent Nature in one sentence, it would be the auto meme from The Simpsons where he asked Marge and Lisa if they have any books written from the vampire's point of view. In this case, we're following a Jason Voorhees XP named Johnny, and it's very obvious that this is post Jason Lives Jason Voorhees. A campfire tale gives us the lore. Johnny was an intellectually disabled, see how hard was that, young boy who hung around the North Ontario logging company where his father worked. Johnny was killed after a cruel joke and a mishap, but every now and again he returns to kill off the loggers. The only thing that keeps him at bay is his mother's locket, which is conveniently stolen by the doofy Trent character in the opening shot of the film. This causes Johnny to rise and go on a murderous backwoods killing spree. The trick of the film, though, is the premise that we're following Johnny as our point of view character through most of the film instead of following the teens. In a normal Friday the 13th movie, which I'm just going to refer to this as because it is so clearly a Friday the 13th movie. And Nash compounds those comparisons by shooting the film in 4x3 to mimic the way most of us saw the Friday series. Not in theaters, but on VHS. In a normal Friday the 13th movie, we'd get a scary opening to establish that there's danger in the woods and then cut to our fresh crop of nubile teens coming in for sex and slaughter. Instead, we just settle in for an over-the-shoulder shot with crunching, flies, and heavy footfalls as our only auditory companions for most of the film. There's not even a Harry Manfredini score. This stylistic choice really does make it feel like someone put Friday the 13th the video game on autoplay and just let it run. We even get the feeling that other characters are NPCs in the story, as their conversations can be overheard from a distance and grow more clear as Johnny gets closer. In fact, if it wasn't for the violence and the copyright infringement, this is the exact type of slow roads content that could accompany those nighttime sounds live streams and get ready with me's on TikTok. The difference between this and some of the villainous protagonist precursors like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer and The Rise of Leslie Vernon is that Johnny doesn't have much of a personality to speak of. Like the Friday films where C.J. Graham or Kane Hodder's performance give the plodding, zombie-like Jason some charisma, Johnny is mostly hulking, wordless brute. I'm gonna get super pretentious about this, Too late. and just label In a Violent Nature as the negative space of a slasher film. It's all the stuff that has to happen off-screen while Jeff and Sandra are grab-assing, or Shelly is having his insult down. Bitch. Or Chris Glover is performing his St. Vitus get-down. In other words, it's the stuff that's not story. There's a moment where the campers take a group photo with Johnny hanging out in the shadows behind them, and this leads to a scene where one of the characters notices that, hey, is that a face in the background of this picture we took? Except, that scene's not actually in the movie, we don't see it, because Johnny's not present for it. We only hear it referenced later on. And that's what makes it fascinating to someone like me who does media studies for a living. These types of narrative questions are usually theoretical thought experiments left on the page. 
But here we are with an honest-to-goodness experimental slasher film found in the wild. So what kinds of things can we pull from this? The first thing is that, like the other Shudder smash hit this year, Late Night with the Devil, the premise can only take you so far before you have to revert to traditional storytelling. In that film, they threw out the, hey, we found the tape of that lady saying that she and her husband made Whoopi in the ass on the newlywed game gimmick that made the film feel like we were seeing a cursed artifact from the vault. But they felt they had to do that in order to get closure on Jack Delroy's relationship with his wife. The same thing happens in this film about 10 minutes in as we stop with the Johnny point of view and switch to a typical Friday the 13th part two slash reboot campfire tale where we get the exposition about Johnny's lore. We also get crumbs of character traits so that we can differentiate characters and get some semblance of relationships. The fact that we switch up to a traditionally shot scene here makes me wonder if Nash didn't shoot it from Johnny's point of view and later decide that it didn't work. And if that's the case, this tells us that you can only stretch the premise so far. But it can stretch pretty far. The thing about slasher movies is that all the criticisms about characters were true. They are only barely characters. This means the audience is doing a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to slasher movie characters. For example, Tina, the Debbie Sue Voorhees character in Friday the 13th, The New Beginning, speaks exactly 35 words in the whole movie. And yet Voorhees was able to parlay that into her own directing gig on a crowd-funded Friday fan film and has her own music video tribute. You didn't have any time to move. Granted, she played the part they were asking her to to perfection, and it was quite memorable for those of us who were of a certain age. But fans tend to do that for even the smallest characters. And In a Violent Nature seems to know this, casting Lauren Marie Taylor and giving her a chance to actually act a scene. More on that in a bit. The point is, in most slasher films, the filmmaker gives us the lines, and the audience spends most of the time coloring them in with what they know about those stereotypes. It's why the characters might seem to us to be more full than they actually are. In a violent nature cuts even that slim characterization to the bone, as most character development is only available to us if Johnny is standing right there. So we get final girl Chris, and we know she's the final girl because she's dating douchey scumbag Troy, the guy who stole the locket in the first place. She has some sort of history with Colt, who is, quote, going through something. It's just the Friday reboot all over again. So you don't want to be friends? There's Aurora, the insufferable leftist influencer, and her potential partner Brody. And of course the jokester of the group who delivers the campfire tale and becomes a running joke about some gas station girls. Which I think might be a really deep cut reference to Darcy DeMoss' character in Jason Lives, who originally met Cord in a gas station scene that got cut from the film. But if you read that scene and then hear the other characters talking about the girls, there are some parallels. And that brings me to, there are films that reward fandom, like Scream, and films that necessitate it, like this. In the theater I saw the film in, a woman grabbed her two children, who appeared to be maybe 8 and 11 years old, and stormed out to cry in the movie as stupid. And like, yeah, it was right after the yoga scene, so I get it, but I'm not sure what she expected. In the post-VHS era, pop culture isn't just a set of IPs or technology delivery devices. Pop culture is its own language. It's why memes work or don't work. It's why if you've never seen a Friday the 13th film, you don't know what the hell I've been talking about. In a pop culture economy, fan knowledge is currency. And films like In a Violent Nature are like when Disney opens a new theme park for you to spend that currency. If you don't know, then Lauren Marie Taylor is just a woman they hired to show up at the end. If you don't know, you don't understand the slow lumbering performance of the killer. If you don't already know, you probably have no idea what the point of the film even is. This one is more of a personal lesson for me, and it's something I realized about myself while writing the Late Night with the Devil essay. I'm not a big fan of violence, it turns out. I know. Weird. I run a horror channel. But I watched my first Friday the 13th movie at 5 years old, much to the horror of my mother, who found out after the fact. But it didn't matter, I was hooked. But I wasn't hooked by the sex or the violence, like most curious kids are. It was the danger. The violence was necessary to establish stakes, but after that, I was more concerned with the characters avoiding the violence. 
That's why I love the blackening so much, and why the original Scream is one of my favorites. The people I cared about, sorry Tatum, survived the ordeal. I don't want to see violence, and when I do, I mostly just wonder how they did it. And now, after about a billion Tom Savini explainers and the special features, I think I'm good. But what really drove this home for me was the infamous yoga kill. It is gross and sadistic, but there doesn't seem to be any reason for it other than the filmmakers wanted to throw some red meat to the gore hounds. Also, the character Aurora probably has like five lines during the campfire scene, and three of them sound like the writers asked an AI to produce social justice speak. So maybe having her have a particularly harsh kill is a sort of dog whistle. At any rate, my reaction was that of a lightly toasted parent ignoring their kids' look at me antics on the diving board. Look, I'm pulling her head through a hole in her chest. Look! That's nice, sweetheart. You make sure to wear sunscreen. I don't object to it, if you enjoy it, more power to you. It just does nothing for me. What did do something, though, was the final stretch. A third act that pulls all these things together in a car ride in which, big time spoiler alert, nothing bad happens. Having the, hey, remember me, asshole, character get murked in a slow and methodical way is something that's shocking only if you're familiar with the genre. And it feels like maybe he's supposed to be the Tommy Jarvis XP. He gets this long monologue about how his dad was part of the original Lumberjack crew with Johnny's dad and how he fought Johnny off once before. He's the legacy character from a movie that doesn't exist. But the more shocking thing is that the advice he gives is dead wrong, no pun intended. And after giving the sapphic justice warrior the film's biggest kill, the movie actually adopts the most feminist solution possible. Just give him the locket. Chris, the final girl, winds up with the locket and suggests they just give it to Johnny since that's what started the carnage in the first place. And Ranger Bob tells her that that won't work. He has to be buried in the same site and there's a whole ritual and gasoline and it's a whole thing. But actually, none of that seems to be the case. That character just seems to be talking out of his ass. And we believe him because, well, he sure sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And usually this character is the one who does know what he's talking about. He's the one that gives the protagonist the final piece of information that they need to execute and send the villain back to hell. But that doesn't happen here. After Johnny turns the tables and kills both of the men who were left over, Chris just leaves the locket behind and runs. And runs. And runs. And we keep waiting for him to jump out at her, a la Friday the 13th Part 2, or for her to get lost and trapped in a cabin or a ranger station for the big showdown, and that just doesn't happen. She eventually stumbles out onto the road and gets picked up by Vicky from Friday the 13th Part 2, and the long, banal conversation at the end is exactly something that would happen if things were going to be alright. But making you think that everything is going to be alright is usually a tactic to lull you into a false sense of security before the big final jump scare. Usually. That's not the film that Chris Nash is making. The film he's making pulls the genre apart and uses your own knowledge and expectations against you. And that makes this film worthwhile, even if it's not your cup of tea. If you don't know, now you know, and I will see you next time.